Having tests in your project is a must, but having high quality tests is even more important than that. And luckily, in this video, we're gonna learn all about testing and its best practices using Node.js. And my hope is that by the end of this video, you're gonna be able to go back to your code, look at it and hopefully improve it. Now, as always, you can take this knowledge to other languages, so it's not specific to Node.js or JavaScript. And with that said, if you're curious, now let's get started. All right, friends, so we're gonna be working with this index.test.js file, which is our testing file for this index.js as you're used to in Node. And this can be any Node application, all right? And what I have here in my package.json is basically a jest, which is our testing framework of choice that we're gonna be using in this video, but it, you can also use any other one because most of them are actually similar. If you wanna play around, go clone Jose's repository because this is the repository that's helping us today with the video. And what I wanna teach you today is actually 10 rules that I want you to know in order to improve your testing skill especially unit testing, but not only. And without further ado, we're gonna start with the very first one, which is the golden rule. Keep it stupid, simple, or simple stupid. Why? Well, we're gonna be spending a lot of brain capacity on actually writing the production code, all right? Maybe we wrote it, or if we do a TDD, we're gonna be writing it in the future after we have our test. But writing the production code is difficult. Why should we make our life even more difficult by making our test suits complicated. You shouldn't. You should keep your tests as simple as possible without any boilerplate code or without much boilerplate code and easy to read. Keep this in mind, this will go a long way. Now, the second rule I want you to also keep in mind is that it's, it's a good practice to have three parts when you try to name your test, okay? In this case, we see that we have a two describe blocks, so inventory, service, add item. So this two are gonna be the very first part. Basically what we're trying to say is that we're testing the inventory service and we're testing the add item. It can be a method, a number of methods, but basically this is a functionality, the add item functionality that we're testing. And now these are our conditions. So the first condition will be when no cost is provided. So first condition, and then the second condition, then the item status should be pending review or is pending, okay? As you can see, first part, second part, and third part, it's always a good practice to elaborate or to make them so transparent. And also, if you're worrying about this notation, which is test, then we start with when. This is basically what Jest likes. If you're using another testing framework, you would probably do it like this, should, and then start with a verb. So for example, have status pending, you get the idea. I will revert this. So in our test here, we're gonna starting with this condition. So when no cost is provided, all right? And since we don't provide any cost, we expect pending review. So just focus on naming your test properly, okay? Then another rule is the AAA pattern. This is very popular within the testing practices. What is it about? So when we do write our test, we should separate our test code into three chunks. So the very first one is gonna be a range, and I'm gonna explain why. The next one is gonna be act, and the third one is gonna be assert. Now, you can see that in this two lines of code, we're actually arranging our test. So we're trying to define the categories, we're trying to have a stop for using just to something to spy on, for example, this method of the database, and then, we're actually acting. So this is where we call the method, categorize user. And then the last part is where we try to assert. Now, you can either decide to add these comments for readability, or you can also omit these comments, but always try to maybe leave a, a blank line here so that it's easier to read because people who are reading your test will assume that this is a range, act, and assert. If you didn't know that, smash like now because this is a pro tip that you just learned. 
All right, going further, the fourth point will be writing declarative tests. Now, I already have a video about declarative programming and imperative programming, but declarative programming is much better when you write tests. So this imperative one is too cluttered. So we're trying to fetch the users. Sure, we define variables and then we have some kind of a for each and these statements look very ugly, okay? We're expecting something if the user is user one, two, three, and then if it's a mod, and then we're modifying this variable, this is very difficult to read. This is the type of test that I wouldn't want to spend my brain on understanding, okay? Tests should be easily understood. If we compare it to the next line, which is pretty much the same test, but, or exactly the same test, but written differently, this can be done literally in two lines, all right? We don't need this for each. We can simply say all moderators to equal expect array containing this mod one or not equal array containing user one, two, three. This is exactly the same thing that we see here in all these three if statements. So make sure that your tests are declarative and then you're good to go. All right, the next one is black box testing. This is kind of a paradigm that you also need to be aware of. Black box testing and there's also white box testing. So black box testing is when something's happening behind the scenes, but you don't actually know and you don't care about those details. Actually not box box, but black box. So what I'm trying to say is, let's say we have a pricing service and we have calculate tech and get product price. So this calculate tax can be a private method. So let me make it private. This is how you do it. You make it private or at least signify that it's private in ES6 or the newest JavaScript. Unless you use TypeScript, then you can simply in TypeScript put the private um, keyword like this, but we don't have TypeScript today. So this is the private method, calculate tax. And this get product price is our public method. And you know that when you try to test your code, you should only test the public method and not the private one because private ones are private to the class itself. And now here, this is a white box test, which is bad, okay? We're trying to calculate tax and get the total of it, which is basically trying to uh, act, uh, try, trying to grab the value from a private method. No, we don't do that, okay? Instead, we should try to get the product price and put the product ID, something like that, okay? Just modifying your test will fix this. Okay, why? Why is it? Um, the thing is, if the calculate tax calculation changes in the future, maybe this will go to 1.3. We're not interested in those details. What we want to test at the end of the day is the product price. Okay, you know, so we're gonna care about the product price and not the underlying details like the cal tax calculation. Okay. Now, before we go to our next point, I just want to mention that this video is sponsored by Squish, which is an excellent tool for functional GUI test automation. What is cool about Squish, you may ask? Well, Squish provides an efficient and agile automated GUI testing with multi-toolkit applications. It has a ton of powerful features that can tackle any testing challenges you might have. But some that I found the most beneficial are, for example, recording and playback. You can record, edit and execute tests with Squish without a steep learning curve. It's very intuitive. The tool also offers extensive integration options. It's fully compatible with CI, CD systems and version control, streamlining your workflow for rapid deployment. Another example for its versatility is that it's available in whichever scripting language you use. And it's especially good at testing applications on multiple different platforms. Whether you're working with Java, Windows or anything else, Squish has you covered with powerful property-based support. There are a lot of materials on Squish online, but I'd actually recommend trying out this interactive tour so you can see firsthand how it exactly works. You really get a good general idea and feel of the tool. If you want to support my channel, then make sure to check out today's sponsor. You will find the link to the tour in the video description below. So go try it out and let me know what you think. And now back to the video. All right, we left off at the sixth point, which is realistic input data. Okay, so when we try to add input to our test, for example, we're trying to add item and you can say something like item one and then item two, because you know, it's a test and we don't really care about values. But the thing is we actually do. So be careful when 
trying to put some nonsense variables into your tests because we're gonna try to make them as close to the reality as possible. So item one and item two probably are not a good idea. And what I would suggest or what Yoni Goldberg suggests, because this video is actually based on his amazing article on JavaScript testing. Faker, Faker is a great library that we can use. Basically, it can generate massive amounts of fake data in the browser and Node.js. And the cool thing is here is that it doesn't only generate this data, but it also has different features. There can, for example, person, location, date, finance, commerce. In our case, it would be commerce because apparently our tests are based on an e-commerce website. So we can generate the prices, we can generate product names, adjective and descriptions. How cool is that? Okay, so we would basically use Faker here and get commerce, product name, and we can also get Faker, data type, number, and make our tests realistic, okay? We don't put gibberish there, but we make our, our variables, values that we use more realistic. And then we're able to catch the bugs that are occurring in our code, all right? And the next point is very important and interesting. It's called property-based. What does it mean? And you can also see that we're importing some kind of a library called FastCheck. What is that? Well, let's go and see it with ourselves. So FastCheck is one of the libraries that lets you do property-based test. What is property-based testing? Well, let me, so let's say, just look into this line here. Let's say I have a method here and method expect um, X variable and Y variable. So the thing is, when you pass realistic data here, or let's say X is zero, or literally X is, let's say, foo and Y is bar, whatever, right? We are only testing these two combinations. But as you know, when you write tests, it's good to also sometimes cover the edge case. And even when the edge cases throw are supposed to throw errors, okay? So sometimes you also want to test Y with an undefined, okay? And then make sure that you handle this case and that your code doesn't break. Or maybe a null value. Or maybe instead of uh, passing a string, you pass a number. And then your test should still work, okay? Your, your code should still work. And what fast check this library enables us to do is basically get an enormous amount of combinations that you can put into your test, basically to test, okay? So what we're gonna do here is we're going to use this contains method. Okay, it's it's very simple. It's basically you give it a text and then pattern and it makes sure that pattern is included in the text. And what we're gonna do here, since we have ABC, so ABC is our text and we're trying to check if B is inside. Now ABC are gonna be three different strings and fast check is going to generate different types of data for it to check it in the background. Sometimes it's gonna have three strings. Sometimes it's also gonna have an empty string made or some kind of an undefined value to try to break your test. How cool is that? And make sure you integrate it into your test and use it whenever the situation allows it or whenever it's appropriate to use it, okay? The next point will be dealing with only necessary data. Okay, so imagine we have this test helpers and we want to create a transaction. What you can do is that you can pass this basically default transaction. Um, you can see that it's a big object. You can pass this one into here, okay? Into here when you try to create a transaction. And then you're gonna have to work with this in every in every test suit. And maybe in the next text, test your transaction amount should be a bit different. So it's gonna be a lot of boilerplate, boilerplate code. And as we said in the golden rule, we want to avoid a lot of duplication and boilerplate code. So instead, let's say we have this helper object and we're able to create transactions and see and look what we're doing here. Basically, we're gonna return an object which is similar to our default transaction, but we're going to spread any options that you give us, okay? For example, in here, we're gonna say balance 50. So it's gonna overwrite the default balance 1000 and transaction amount 100. So it's gonna overwrite the default transaction amount 200. And then we're gonna have a really cool new transaction request to work with. And we ha this is how we can reuse it in every test without having to copy this object in every test. This is a big game, okay? So make sure that you can always reuse your test helpers and big object, all right? Now, number nine, catching error. There are two ways to work with errors. Either you can try to actually mimic your production code and say, oh, I'm gonna create a new item, but it's empty. 
and then try to catch the error. And while you're catching the error, you can try to do expect to be invalid input. Not good because some of the testing frameworks are actually either gonna fail or they're gonna clutter your um, logs with stack traces. We don't want that either, okay, with error messages. Instead, we should always try to use the native testing frameworks um, error catch. For example, in this case, just has this rejects and it has this to throw error. And into to throw error, we can basically say which kind of error we're expecting. And this is how we're helping just to basically not try to be too verbose when the tests are running. Okay, make sure you're running or using native error handling of your testing framework. And now coming to the very end, TDD, aka test-driven development. What is test-driven development? Let's see. From Martin Fowler, we're gonna see that TDD is really cool. In most of the cases, it's gonna let you write your tests as if it's a documentation. And then when somebody reads your test, they're gonna basically understand how your application works. Also, it lets you cover most of the edge cases. Downsides, sometimes when you're doing UI test, UI programming, so on the front end, TDD is difficult because a lot of UI and DOM elements, but generally speaking, TDD is good, especially for backend development or any other kind of development. What does it mean? In TDD, we're gonna write this test and make sure that it fails because we don't have any production code. We're writing our tests before the production, okay? So write a test for the next bit of functionality you want to add, and this functionality is not given yet. Then we're gonna write the functional code until the test passes. This is where we try to make it green, and then refactor both new and old code to make it well struck. <coughs> Basically, we're trying to, we're gonna try to refactor our production code if needed, or more specifically, or more importantly, we're gonna refactor our test. And then we're gonna pick the next test or production functionality that we want to add, write a test, let it fail, then make it pass, and so on. Basically, we're gonna go in circle. I hope this was understandable and you learned something. If you did, smash the like and subscribe. If you did not, feel free to leave a comment. I will try to answer it. And with that said, I will see you in the next videos, which are gonna be about backend testing and frontend testing specifically. So stay tuned. Goodbye.